Good afternoon. This is CIVE 632, Computational Hydraulics and Hydrology. And today is November 29, 2011. And this is the, the first session of the 15th week, 15th and last week of teaching. Uh, next week, uh, we're going to have our project presentations. So uh, let's get started here. Today, I am going to present three papers on applications. And then on Wednesday, I'm going to present one paper because it's a long one. The one on Wednesday, the, uh, the, the ones today are, they, they vary from short to long. Okay, so with that, that then with any further ado, as they say, let me, let me open up the, the paper. Can you guys see a blue page? Yes, we can. Okay, cool. Okay, um, the first paper, we're gonna be talking about sediment routing here. And some of you actually may be familiar, those of you that took um, sedimentation engineering may have actually have seen me talk about these papers. So it, it's a, it will be a, a repeat, but some of you have not, so I have to cover it because this this subject here is both sedimentation as well as um, computational hydraulics so um, let me start the, the lecture today by addressing the issue of the celerity of transient bed profiles now this paper is one of the ones that are, they still remain to be converted to html so no big deal it's big enough i think you're all seeing it, right? You can read it, right? Let me add one more in there. There you go. There That's you go. good. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay, cool. Okay. Yeah, the system works well. Um, so let me first start by saying that I went, I returned to grad school. I got a master's degree at Colorado State University in the year 1970. And three years later, after spending, spending three years in Lima, Peru, I went working in a company as an engineer. I, were, I went back to school. I decided to go back to school to get a doctorate, a PhD. So I signed up with Professor Simons. I first knocked on his door back. I remember it was in August of the year 1990, 1973. And uh, I showed, <laughs> this is interesting. I showed him a paper that I had published on based on my master's thesis. And I said, you know, I would like to get into the program for the PhD. And he said, well, ask everybody else, well, let me let me look into it and give me a call in the next couple of days. So I did. The next couple of days I called him and he says, yeah, Fonz, you're in. We have plenty of room in here. Uh, it, it, it was late, but it was OK. So uh, I signed up with one of uh, Daryl Simons is a professor Simons is assistant at the time. He was already a doctor and he was a professor, but Daryl had a big operation out there at the time. This is uh, 48 years ago. And so the first thing that Professor Mahmoud asked me to do was routing of sediment, sediment routing, basically. Bad sediment routing because he was uh he had a project in pakistan he was originally from pakistan and this is one of the problems that have been identified identified in pakistan what happened was that the pakistani had built over the years uh, late 50s and throughout 60s and 70s uh, 12 link canals these canals were linking the um the western side of the indus basin with the eastern side. There were four rivers out, out there that were coming, coming, flowing from the Himalayas. Uh, but there was a political problem out there after partition. Partition was in 1947, and uh, the Indian government uh, owned the headwaters of the east base, of the two east basins. And uh, the Pakistanis owned the headwaters of the western basins. So the Indians proceeded because there was, I'm sure, some animosity out there. They proceeded to take the water, uh, which originated in the Himalayas of the eastern basins, and they left basically 
dry the flows of these two rivers. I don't remember the names right now. I got the map somewhere. Uh, so then the Pakistani had to build these huge canals. And I do not recall having seen another project that big. The canals were carrying on the order of 15 to 25,000 CFS. By comparison, uh, the, the California Canal, the one that, uh, what is it called? The, uh, it's not called the California Canal. It's called the, uh, the big, the huge canal in California. It's uh, the California Aqueduct that we have here. Uh, I believe it runs 16,000. So the Lincoln Canals with, were much larger than the, than the California Aqueduct. But they were built alluvial. They either decided they didn't have the money or whatever. They were going to run the canals as if it were rivers, only that artificial rivers. So, uh, but at the beginning, they either made a mistake or there was a flood out there. I don't know the exact details of it, but they had a huge transient, a wave, a sand wave, get into one of the channels. I believe it was a QB, uh, one of the canals that I was working in. And so Mahmoud developed a project, Professor Mahmoud developed a project of figuring out how long was it going to take for this sand wave to travel throughout the channel, which was about, I don't know, 60 or 70 miles. Huge projects, by the way, huge hydraulic projects. And uh, so when I got in there, that's what he wanted to do. So he basically told me, Ponce, this is what we're going to do for the next year or so. So he recommended that I study this and I study that. So I, I took the job. And for one year, I routed sediment transients. That was it. Then after that, we did some other things. Um, the, uh, my dissertation was on the same topic, but not quite the sediment transients. My dissertation was more into uh, meandering, the generation of meandering, but it was kind of related. It was all river mechanics. We were studying river mechanics. I got a degree in river mechanics. Never mind that after that I did many other things, but at the time my core, my kernel knowledge was in river mechanics. So I wrote this paper um, in the year 1981 when I was already here at San Diego State. I came to San Diego State in the year 1980. And I decided to write this paper because I had, I had a formula for the calculation of the celerity, which we have already talked about. You would recall a week or so, two, two weeks. And I found this data written by a gentleman by the name of Sony, right, Sony et al. The Sony et al. paper had a, a measurement, a laboratory measurement of the celerity. So I said, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to take my formula and take Sony's data and see if they match. And I'll write another paper, but, uh, or technical note. Now you would know that the technical note, this is a technical note, it's not a paper. What's the difference? For those of you that are going to be into the uh, academic uh, route, uh, a paper at the time, I don't know if they may change because I haven't been published in lately, but uh, a paper had a maximum limit of 16 pages, a paper. And the technical note was four pages. So a technical note was supposed to be a small paper, a mini paper. And it was understood from the rules that it was something that had not been completely closed or developed to the point where it would marry a long paper. So they gave uh, the authors uh, around the world the possibility of still getting published if you had an idea that it was not fully cooked. Okay, so this is why this paper was a technical note, mostly because it was um, short. It was short. I was just going to take my formula and compare it with Sony's data and see if, how they agreed and so forth. Now you would realize, as I have said before, that that sedimentation engineering is a pretty, if you want to call it tough or easy business, because you can make a mistake. You can make a 100% mistake and nobody's going to wink an eye because there's so much variability. Uh, the variability in sedimentation is typically four or five orders of magnitude. So if you're going to hit it, you're going to hit it right, and there's a lot of ample room for missing it. So as we say, and I've said this before, and I'll repeat it, it bears repeating. In hydraulics, you're allowed a 2% error. In hydrology, 30%.
And in sedimentation engineering, 100% outright. You can be mistaken 100%. How does that work? 100% sounds like off the bat. No, because you're in the ballpark. There's going to be a lot of variability. And when we're in the ballpark, no, we don't encourage or uh, encourage uh, this variability. But the fact of the matter is that every once in a while, and I have an example that I believe I discussed with you, that is exactly the case. We erred by 100% and we're still back when the good correlation coefficient. Okay, so we have the, 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 the data by Sony. Another story I'm going to tell you which relates to this. I have a friend, I called him this afternoon, I couldn't get a hold of him. He's an older gentleman. He's about eight to 10 years my senior, and I believe he's still around. I checked him today, he was on the web, and I wanted to see if he could send me a PDF copy of his master's thesis, because I wanted to somewhat read it quickly and show it to you. I, I guess it was an afterthought. I should have done this last week, but no, I didn't. I didn't get a hold of him. But I'm going to tell you, this gentleman, his name is Wallace Walters, and he got a, a master's degree at Colorado State at the same time I was getting a PhD. I think it was 75 or 76. And what did Wally do? He was working for the Army Corps at Vicksburg, Vicksburg, Mississippi. And uh, the Army Corps of Engineers at Vicksburg, they run the lab at Vicksburg, and they have a lot of data, river data. They specialized in river. They have a special section on potomology. And potomology, as you guys would know, is the study, the scientific study of rivers. It comes from pota, which in Greek means rivers or water, something like this. I, I don't know Greek, but that's, that's what it is. Potomology, P-O-T-A-M-O-L-O-G-Y. Okay, so uh, Wally, Wally was his name, he went by Wally. He identified a problem out there in the Mississippi he had, the, uh, which related to the sand waves that we're going to talk about today, uh, he uh, had identified that there was an earthquake, which I believe was a series of earthquakes, I believe. You can check it out. The New Madrid, the New Madrid earthquakes. Where's New Madrid? New Madrid is in Missouri, I believe. It's uh, about a few miles south of St. Louis. Uh, as a matter of fact, I believe I've talked about this before the uh, Birds Point New Madrid flood wave that was operated in the year 2011 with the big flood, the big flood on the Ohio and also included the Mississippi. So the flood wave is from Birds Point to New Madrid. So the, that same New Madrid. In New Madrid, there were a couple of earthquakes, very strong earthquakes, some of the strongest in the U.S. And they tore up the bluffs. I've heard of you heard me talk about the bluffs. The bluffs are where the valley ends. They're usually very steep, uh, but the Mississippi is a very wide river, but it does have bluffs. But the bluffs were basically torn apart, destroyed by the earthquake. And then it rains a lot out there, not quite a lot, but it rains, you know, Missouri area, Ohio and so forth. So that sediment in a certain period of the time got all the way to the river, but it was so much sediment that it created this wave and the, the army knew because the army run, they runs their ships over their boats over there so they know when there's extra sand in the bottom of the river so they knew that they they measure the river and they, the, the, the bathymetry so to speak so they knew that this was the, the army was at the time army corps was running the rivers and they knew that there was the sand and the question was how long was this sand going to take to dissipate if it remains a sand wave it will travel if it becomes obliterated by the flow, which is not likely because the flow is very mild and so forth, it will, it will not travel. And it would sit there and it increase the, the amount of sediment at the bottom. And that would be a problem. It turned out that this sand wave took about 150 years, according to Wally Walter's calculations, to make it all the way to the Gulf. I and mean, that's exactly what we're going to be talking about here today. The velocity of these, the celerity of these transient bed profiles is very small. It's about one 500 to 1,000 part of the velocity of the flow. So that's what, that is a preamble of what we're going to say here today. So we have a formula, which is this formula over here, 
which you may recall we have already generated by using our techniques that we have. We have applied this in, in for both for the water, and that led to the S-curve, and then for the sediment, it led to the celerity, and celerity and attenuation. And we had to, we didn't call it a celerity, just a celerity, but a celerity sub phi, because we had to normalize it by creating a, uh, a sediment transport function in here to normalize it. So this is the formula. And these, you will recall that these are parameters that we have already used. The celerity, the dimensionless celerity, the dimensionless uh, wavelength, which is again non-dimensionalized by, by our use of L sub O over S sub O, which is D sub O over S sub O, which is L sub O. All of you are very familiar with these concepts. Then the fruit number, and then we have the phi. We define the phi in terms of what we call the Colby function. It's a simple, it's about the simplest celerity, or rather sediment transport function that you could use. Uh, Colby used this sediment transport function, and Colby, the, the Colby method is very much used in sedimentation engineering. Uh, variations of, of this transport, not exactly this transport, but this is a well-known function in sedimentation engineering. So that allowed us to define this phi over here and change it a little bit from solid to volume. And then we finally ended up with, um, with a celerity, which is very easily expressed in terms of the fruit number for large values of sigma. So over here, we, this is, you, I already shown you this figure. So this is the function of the celerity, transport normalized celerity. As you can see, when the, when the, when the wavelength gets, gets uh, large, this drives itself to zero. And if it's not large, if, it's, if it assumes a certain measurable wave, wavelength, it, it has a tendency to move independent of the wavelength with the, with the fruit number. And this is also understandable and verifiable. Uh, the fruit number, the faster fruit number or the larger fruit number creates a larger velocity. Okay, so this is a very good uh, formula. And this is what we're going to use, by the way. So then I, and then we said, we're going to take a look at what um, Sony did. Now, I do not believe that at the time that we did this, anybody had measured these sand waves because they were simply not logistically very difficult to do. The only people or group that could do this would be the Army Corps. They would have the resources to do this and they'd have to do it in a long time, like in years, five, 10 years. But uh, Sony did this because he was also interested on, on the subject, on the topic of transient propagation, sediment transient propagation, bed transient. It's not just, this is not the sediment that is suspended. It's the sediment that has already settled, is in the bed. It's a transient. Why is it moving? Because it's being, there's a difference in momentum between the, the center of the wave and the upstream. So that has a tendency to push it. Basically, the difference in momentum is pushing the wave upstream. Okay, so this, these are the data for, from Sony. And I figure that I could come up with some celerity. Now, this is laboratory data, by the way. But I could come up with a celerity, and sure, we did. We came up with a celerity. This is our formula that we used. The celerity is equal to the transport normalized function times u, because u was originally over here in the denominator, was put over here, and multiplied by this number over here, applicable the case, applicable for the case of a sufficiently large sigma. So then we undertook we undertook to do the experimental verification. We assume the porosity, we that doesn't vary a whole lot. These are sands that are kind of loose sands. They're not very thick. So porosity of 0.4, porosity of the sand, I mean. Uh, characteristic length of the perturbation was estimated 20 meters and so forth. So we got a sigma of 12. And with a fruit number of 0.45 for the Sony data, uh, we sigma equal 12 lies within the range for which the celerity is independent. That means on the right side of the graph, Therefore, we apply equation nine, and we lead to a, a calculated celerity 0 0.0021 meters per second. So two millimeters per second of the Sony data. That's not the Mississippi, the Sony data. 
And uh, we then take, took a look at uh, the Sony data. It turned out that the Sony data was about 0 0.0, 10 measurements that we did was 0 0.0029. And we say that it compares favorably with the theoretical celerity. Why is that? Because like I said, we're working on sedimentation. This is a, what, a 20, 30% error. That's fine. That is fine. That looks like hydrology. <laughs> that, that's the way it is. Um, and then we made some corrections in here because we had an, a function to, to, uh, that had been developed by Lopez Garcia, who was working with us at the time. He was a grad student over at Colorado State. And we were able to, um, uh, we said that that formula was for small amplitude, but the Sony data was not small amplitude. So we basically made a correction in here based on data that Lopez Garcia had developed. And we ended up with a celerity, the theoretical celerity being 0 0.0025, which, which now compares more favorably with the 0029 over here. So that was the end of this computation. And I think that um, if anybody's interested in doing this, I mean, not just you guys, everybody, anybody around the world, could use this data in this example to figure out how long these, these waves will stay in the river. And I do believe that, uh, they, that this kind of celerity kind of matches the work that Wally Walters did. Unfortunately, I don't have his thesis to show you. Hopefully I'll get it, but I don't know if he even has it in PDF. I don't think he could send it just outright the copy of the thesis. Okay, so we are in there now. We finished one paper and we're moving on to the second paper. And this one is called modeling. I'm going to do this one and this one today. Modeling alluvial channel bed transients. This is a paper. This one is already in HTML. Uh, as I already told you, I'm going to get all my 52 papers in English on HTML. Right now I have about 45. So we're still working on a few, a few of them that need to be completed, converted into HTML. Okay, so this paper is called Modeling Alluvial Channel Bed Transients. So it is kind of related to the, what we had before, what we just read right now, a minute ago. The difference is, in, is that in here we're modeling, we're modeling numerically. Now, it is not my intention, intention for you to learn in detail what we're going to say here today, there is certainly no time. In order to learn, you would have to practice. You would have to develop a project. There's no other way to learn, by the way. The real, the, the real learn is by getting your feet wet. The, nevertheless, I'm going to be talking about concepts in here, which I'm hoping that you will be able to pick up how we did it, why we did it, and what the results are, and what are the concepts. I'm more, more interested in you learning how this is done in case you had a problem, a similar problem in the future. Or when you work with HEC RAS, most people are going to do that. I'd say 98% of the people are going to work with HEC RAS, and 2% are going to try to do some modeling. Why? That's just the way, that's the way the ball bounces, uh, particularly in, in, um, in uh, consulting firms. And I know many of you work with consulting firms. You can't do research in consulting firms unless you have a contract with a university, which there are those other people that can do research. And that's the reason why universities get involved in research, because this kind of stuff, hydraulics, the consulting firms are not going to do it. So if you work for a consulting firm, it's not likely that you're going to be doing any model development, to be honest with you. But you could. You could if you somehow, whatever, it depends, you know, the circumstances vary. Uh, I can tell you that uh, from my experience, uh, actual circumstances depend. I had a student many years ago, maybe 20, 25 years ago. He was at the top, in the top of, it, of his class in the year 1995. And we visited oh, four or five years later. And I said, John, I think his name was something I don't remember right now. I said, John, how are you doing? Because he was working with one of the consulting firms, the, one of the big consulting firms in town. And he said, great, we just did a a model of a, we just put a model of a reservoir routing. He said, oh, I said, nice. And I said, what do you, I mean, you're using a model or you developed a model? He says, no, we developed a model. I said, oh, how'd you do that? 
he looked at me in the face and he says, we use your book, Professor Paz. <laughs> Meaning he took the stuff out of my book and sat down and in a few days, obviously, developed the model. So this is nothing that cannot be done, but you have to have the time, somebody, somebody's got to pay for it or else you go to school and at school you have a little more leeway and you can develop your own, your own uh, model, your own calculation. I was lucky that when I was back, at, I got involved in doing this, it was luck outright because there were about 10 or 12 professors, they all hired students and I could have done something else, totally different. Every professor is doing a different thing. But I lucked out with Professor Mahmoud. Uh, I like this stuff. Um, as you know, or you probably don't know, but I was coming from a background, a mixed background in water and geotech. I was kind of in the middle. My original interest was to des design earth dams. But I realized at the time that there weren't too many to be designed, so I was going to starve to death. So then one thing led to another, and I decided to do a kind, kind of a switch into water, because I felt that the water was broader and it had, there was a lot more chances to, to, uh, to do good work, nice and good work. I actually liked the water area more than I liked the soil part of it. So I decided to do something in the middle. I was going to get into sediment and water. Sediment is still soil, but it is mostly water, right? So that's how 48 years later, it was still in the area. So flow in alluvial channel is of unsteady unif non-uniform type. Uh, the water and sediment discharge vary in time and space, right? We know there's unsteadiness, not only in the water, but also in the sediment. So that's what we're going to do in here. We're going to do an unsteady calculation of sediment but we're going to be looking at sediment transients because those are the ones that we're interested in. As a matter of fact, there's a graph over there and I'm going to show you what, I'm going to tell you at this point what that graph does. We use the model that we built here in this paper in order to, to fill up a dam with sediment because you know you put a dam together and then the dam's going to start to filling up with sediment. And the, the rate of sediment filling will depend on the height of the dam, the flow, the hydraulic characteristics, and so forth. And if you look at this, and it's not very clear over there, but I have it, I have it expressed in here. That's just for show. There it is. This is a little bigger. Bed elevation, distance in miles. This is a small dam, not a big dam. And uh, this was done 96 day intervals. So the so at the beginning it was in here, the wave, it was a wave, a sediment wave. The bottom, the bottom of the river was over here. When it started, well, first it was over here. Then it was over here, it started filling in 96 days, it got all the way here. Then twice 96, three times 96, four times 96, five times 96, six times 96. So you can see that 90, in about 600 days, in about two years, we model the rate of filling of this dam. It's a sediment trapping dam. It's supposed to trap uh, a dam. There's dams built to trap water. Those are more regular dams, but there's also sediment trapping dams. Uh, it's, it's, uh, they're being built wherever there's a lot of sediment and they got to control it. I can recall that there was an issue in Santa Barbara, which I, some, those of you that uh, work with uh, Professor Kinoshida may have heard of it, uh, but in the year 1990, was it 89, 89 or 90, there was a huge fire out there in Santa Barbara not the only one, there have been several out there. And it created, um, it burned a lot of acreage. And then, and then um, the year later, they had the famous uh, Miracle March. It was March of 1991. They rain, they had a lot of rain, but the people over there were managing over there, realized that they were gonna have a problem. So they built two sediment trapping dams in the in in the uh, in the probability that uh, burning was going to cause a lot of sediment to move and sure enough in march of the next year uh, the fire was in uh, july of the year 1990 the, uh, no not the fire the yeah the fire and then the rain was in march of the year 1991 and um, uh, they built these two sediment trapping dams and they were filled up by about half which means that they kind of over, 
over design, which is fine. I mean, I have no problem with that. Uh, remember, the uh, error in 100% is totally acceptable in the question of sediment. So these sub sub subjects are being handled. As a matter of fact, the gentleman that designed these dams, I happen to know because I actually visited the place. The gentleman that designed these two sediment trapping dams was our top student in the year 1990, 1985. I don't remember his name right now, but I visited with him. Uh, top San Diego State students. He was hired by, by um, Santa Barbara Flood Control District, and five years later, he found himself designing these two sediment trapping dams. He got into hydraulics. Okay, so, okay, so I'm going to show you the basic lines or the basic concepts in order how to put this thing together. Uh, first, we call we talk about the method. There's the sequential routing method and the non-discharge method. Uh, since the transients, since the water transients move with the same, with much larger speed than the sediment transients, then if you're going to calculate both the water and the sediment, it becomes kind of ineffective or, or inefficient because you use one delta t. You're going to have to use the delta t of the water. You can't. Otherwise, the water would you wouldn't model the water if you use the delta t of the sediment. Both of them have to have a uh, current number. The current number has to be followed, right? The current bet current number. Okay. So we develop here the known discharge method, which is apply a, uh, an approximate uh, discharge for the water and then run it through. Basically, the water is not going to be a problem. It's going to have a known discharge. If if we um, if you are concerned about this, you can always vary the discharge every once in a while with a with a uh, we, with a calculation to vary just the discharge or run run a, a steady state water service profile. But in this case, we didn't do it this way. We were developing the concept, right? This had not been done really at that time by anybody. Very few people have gone into this area at that point. That's why we were at Colorado State doing that work. Um, so we developed a known discharge method, meaning we're not going to solve the water. We're going to solve just the sediment. Okay. Now, uh, known discharge coupled model is presented here. The model represents an improvement over earlier models in that instability due to ill posing of the bed transport function is circumvented. What happened was that we were using when we started, we were using Einstein's method. We said, oh, we're going to use Einstein method because it's the best. We were wrong because Einstein method can get into dark corners and be unstable. That's just the way it is. So we decided to dump the Einstein method. Uh, we could not get into the modified Einstein because the modified Einstein is a practical method and it requires measurements, field measurements. The modified Einstein is to calculate the sediment load based on field measurements, the actual sediment load. We talked about this in sedimentation engineering last year. So then we decided to replace it for the Kobe method. And I should mention to you that Einstein, the Einstein method was so complex that hardly anybody would use it. And Kobe decided to simplify it, kind of train it down or dominate it. And he developed the modified Einstein method which is basically a Kobe creation, but it's based on the modified Einstein. And those of you that uh, have taken uh, sedimentation engineering with me last year already saw it, and perhaps we even did a calculation with the modified Einstein. We, in the year 19, uh, when was it? In the year 1995, no, not, 1975, uh, Mahmoud, uh, Mahmoud had three or four students at the time. And he engaged one of our one of our students who was my friend. He was a master student, a gentleman from Pakistan. And he asked him to develop a computer program of the modified Einstein. And that was not an I'm sorry, not a modified Einstein. Mod, yeah, that's right, the modified Einstein. And that was not an easy assignment, by the way. It required a lot of Fortran knowledge. So the the, the student came to me and said, uh, and with the permission of Professor Mahmoud. He said, you know, I'm going to call Pons to help me out and we'll put it together. And sure we did. We spent about a month or a little more than a month doing this, this work, putting the modified Einstein together in Fortran. It was a lot of fun, by the way. I, I really love 
continue to love Fortran, even though I don't use it a whole lot, because you, I already told you guys, we replaced it for PHP, even though PHP has a tendency to be 10 and even 50 and even more slower than Fortran. Fortran is just a beauty in terms of speed, but it can only do floating point. I told you that already. Okay, so we did the work, and uh, that was in 1975-76. And then in the year, I believe it 2007, right? 2007, 2008, when we had already become good with PHP, I translated the Fortran to PHP and put it on the web. The calculation is pretty simple, pretty straightforward. It's a few charts, about 12 charts that were developed by Einstein. And that stuff in the computers that we have right now is very fast. So there's no big deal. There was no issue of speed in relation to using the modified Einstein with either PHP or Fortran. Fortran would take 0.01 seconds and PHP would take two seconds. So what's the difference, you know? 20, 100 times more, but still in the seconds, in the very small seconds category. So we did that. Uh, I should tell you at, uh, uh, just for the heck of it, that in the meantime, in the 1950s, I went to a conference and I found out somebody that had actually written a peripheral. It's, it's kind of peripheral. Uh, a peripheral program to run a model with Windows or with some such GUI method, because GUI was, was coming up in the middle and the early, eight, early 90s is when GUI came up. And I said, oh, modified Einstein. Somebody did another cop another version of the modified Einstein. And that, that was a Fortran. So he had done an interface with Fortran in order for you to run it like, like GUI, right? And I looked up and I said, cool, somebody else did another Fortran. And I looked up at the paper and they were quoting me as the generator of the source or the kernel, the source. So basically they were using my program. They had really dressed our program into their work. Okay, so I am not sure. I do believe, actually, that the Bureau of Reclamation has a modified Einstein computer program running in Fortran. That's um, I didn't touch it. They did it. Because, I mean, if you sit down and you're good at it, you can do it. Okay? There's a few, maybe a couple or three around the world. Ours is on the web, so anybody that could use it, it's easy for, it, for them to use it. Uh, so that's the, on the modified Einstein. Uh, we used a, a Colby method. I got in there because I said you could, we used the Colby method because the Colby method was developed by Colby seven years after he developed the modified Einstein. I'm, I take that back, nine years. 1955 was the modified Einstein by Colby. And 1964 was the Colby method, the properly called Colby method. And I am given to understand that Colby decided to do the, the Colby method because he had used the modified Einstein but he realized there was a good method, but he had to use data. Without data, you can't use the modified Einstein. So he said there was a law in there that needed to be written in terms of what is the law for sediment transport, and he came up with his own Colby method for transport of sands. And he tried it on one of the rivers in Nebraska. It worked reasonably well, and this method was so simple that uh, my professor, Daryl Simons, used it a lot, and he always recommended because it is not only simple, it will not disappoint you like Einstein did. And even modified Einstein sometimes could disappoint you, meaning get into some corner and not get a calculation, not with the Colby method. The Colby method is foolproof, totally foolproof. It is an approximate method. We only have two or three inputs, but it's still good enough. Considering the fact that we have already talked about the accuracy to be expected in a calculation of sediment routing, the Gobi method is fine. I recommend it. Uh, it's not everything, but it is good, good enough to be used on a on, on daily practice. So what we have in here on usual practice, what we have in here is a, 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 simul, a simulation or a, a method similar to the Gobi method. Okay, so we have in here the Exner equation. Number one is the general, uh, the continuity of sediment. This is the continuous, continuity of sediment. The gradient of the sediment load, the change in time of the concentration along the depth or through the depth, 
and the change in the z, the elevation of the bed. This is not the Exner equation. This is the general continuity of sediment equation. Okay, but this equation was simplified because the second term happens to be not only intractable, but also very small. We know for a fact that the second term is very small. The term that is not small is the third one. Let before the before the the minus the equal sign in here. So so what happened was that the second term was dropped, as we normally do when we run into a problem. And this equation number three is it's the so-called Exner equation. Apparently, Mr. Exner, I think the date, I'm not quite sure, but I, I, I'm hoping perhaps maybe at the end. No, no. He was from Switzerland, I believe. So Exner, uh, where is it? I lost it. The governing equation, there we go, there it is. Equation number three. Equation number three is the Exner equation. It basically says that if the sediment went into the control volume and it didn't come out, okay, it must have settled. It doesn't stay in the, in the, in the profile, it just settles. And this is what we call aggradation or degradation. So the Exner equation, which is this equation, is used to study aggradation and degradation. Now, all these are transient processes. Transient means unsteady. Mother Nature does not like transient. Anytime there's transient, he has a she has a tendency to diffuse it, obliterate it, and get rid of it. And that's why floods are like that. Floods happen, but they, they, they're normally, the floods don't stay there. The only flood that stays there for six months is the Paraguay, because the Paraguay has so much water, and it diffuses so much that it diffuses to one sinusoid that travels through the through the river in six months, and then it, it achieves a lower value, and then it comes back the next six months. And we know, for instance, that the Paraguay drops its, 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 its uh, level November, December, and rises to peaks June, uh, May, June, and July. We know that for a fact. The Amazon also has kind of the same behavior, but I am given to understand, I think I've seen this before, that the Amazon has two peaks because it has two hydrologic phenomena, one coming from above the equator and another coming from below the equator. And the processes are of rainfall or when it happens are totally different. So the, the Amazon has a peak in February and a peak in May, two peaks, uh, which goes on to say that the Amazon had less diffusion than the Paraguay. The Paraguay is the most diffusion only one flood wave per year, right? I was really surprised when I, uh, when I went over there and saw that. It's a stuff that actually is not in the books. It's not in the hydrology books because it's very unusual. As a matter of fact, I have not practiced throughout the world. I mean, I have actually practiced, I've counted the, the countries I visited is 20 and there's 240 countries in the world. Well, 200, 220, 240 governments independent governments. So I visited one tenth of the, the country, the countries, not a whole lot. So I can't tell you actually out there in Africa, I have not been to Africa, uh, Asia, a little bit of Asia, but not to work. I actually was going, well, I take that back. Asia is India, not just China. I was in India. I did some work in India, uh, not in China, but at any rate, I believe the Paraguay is unique. If it's not unique, then it's among two or three around the world in terms of their diffusion of the diffusion, the total diffusion that they have. You can't, more diffusion in the Paraguay and, and you would not have any wave, which is not the case. There's a certain amount, but uh, it, it does not diffuse completely. It doesn't have a chance. It gets out of the basin before it has a chance to diffuse, right? It's all a matter of the Hayami for, formula, which we already talked about. The Hayami formula indicates the amount of diffusion. Okay. So we have the supplementary equation, the resistance and transport functions. We have this equation five, which I used, I used extensively in my doctoral dissertation, and then that, that, afterwards I liked it. And I liked it because it was a Chessy formula, and I prefer the Chessy to the Manning. I believe the Manning is confusing and it can lead to problems, and unfortunately most people prefer Manning. I don't know why, to be honest with you. 
I really don't know. If I had my choice, I would drop Manning completely and go Chessy only. Now, this Formula 5, those of you that have taken open channels know that it is Chessy formula. It's just a slightly different way of looking at it, but it's a Chessy formula. Uh, where the F is RF and is one eighth of the Darcy Weisbach. And the Darcy Weisbach can be construed a Chessy formula, although I really don't know why there are two names for it. I believe it is because Chessy developed his method for channels and Darcy Weisbach developed it for pipes. But they were kind of, you were working on the same mechanical principles. Okay, so Chessy and Darcy Weisbach are pretty much one and the same. Now my professor Simons, when he did his work in the year 1957 on the huge flume at Colorado State, Colorado State had a huge flume eight foot wide and a thousand feet long, I think. They, they housed it in the lab in the back. It was a huge building, huge lab. I believe, I, I'm hoping not to be incorrect, that it was the largest. At least they say it was very, very large flume. That's where Simons did his PhD work in 1957. He graduated in 1957. I believe Professor Simons was the first PhD in hydraulics at Colorado State. So then we have to understand that prior to 1955, there was not a whole lot of activity. There was some activity, but not a whole lot developing or going on at Colorado State. So Simons and other people that were hired at the time contributed to making Colorado State a big university, a big place to study hydraulics. And it would have started in the mid 50s. So I arrived in 73, so 18 years later, and it was already all formed and everything, okay? So Simons was not using F, I don't know why. We checked the paper by Simons. He was using C over square root of G because he said that he didn't like the fact that by using Chessy, he had to use either metric or US, two values, which is kind of funny because Manning also has two values. You have to remember the 1.49 or the one, right? It's the same thing, but people don't understand it that way. They feel that Manning is better than Jesse, which is not correct. But at any rate, she was, he was using C over square root of G. And I found out, easy, that if you square it and you take the reciprocal, you end up with your F. And I thought the F was more physical, better. So I kind of improved on Simons' presentation. I do not know why Simons did not get to the F, but he didn't because his papers don't mention the F. They mention the C over square root of G, which is kind of in between C and F, because C and F are related. Okay, so that's it. And then the, uh, the formula for transport is six, where the M is, a, is an exponent. Now, what is this exponent going to be? That's an interesting concept, which I believe I have already talked about extensively, if not in hydrology, at least in sedimentation, yeah. M turns out to have a bottom value of three, and it goes from three to seven. And this is what experimentally Colby had found from three to seven. And turns out that with, the, with, with large flows, it's three, and with little flows, it's seven, because it's an exponential function and it's plotted log log. And if you go steep, I, I can't explain it to you at this point, but take my word for it. When the flow is high, M has a tendency to be low. And it cannot go below three because it's mechanically impossible. You cannot have an M equal to 2.5. It's three or else, or higher. And it can go according to Kobe, four, five, six, seven. And Kobe had documented that it could get all the way up to seven. Seven is a very large exponent. If you take two to the seven, that's what? That two to the five is 32, 64, it's about 128, something on that order. So seven, two is like twice. So you double the double the velocity, you get seven times the, not seven times, 128 times the transport because it's two to the seven, right? Okay, so so that formula was easy enough and very well behaved. Uh, the thing about these simple formulas is that they're very well behaved from a numerical standpoint. You don't want to get into something like, like Einstein did. Einstein was theoretical, but it could not be used in practice. So the final different scheme, we use the, uh, the, um, the method of Reisman, which we knew very well. We learned that from the beginning. I was fascinated from the beginning. From the beginning was September, October, 1973 by the theta, the weighting factor, which came with different answers. 
I, I, so my question was, why is a theta, which is totally artificial, giving different answers? And the answer is numerical diffusion, numerical dispersion. We already know that. So we use that formula. Now the question was whether to linearize or not to linearize. And here we go, we have two, two schools in here. Fred, Danny Fred, did not linearize. He went nonlinear. Kunj linearized. Who, who's right? Well, I don't know. Those are two ways of doing it. Uh, Fred argued, even with, with now argued with me, but he told me when we met a couple, three times with Danny Fred, that he preferred the nonlinear scheme because it was better. And obviously, the nonlinear has to be better because the world is nonlinear, but it's more complex and you could run into problems, more calculations. Remember that, what I said? The more calculations, the easier you could run into problems. So I believe Kunch was right, that if we linearize the system and kept the delta t, delta x small, small enough to control the errors of convergence, or rather discretization, that could arise with the linearization, that you could do linearization. And we did that in many instances. We have actually compared. If the linearization is like difficulty one, the nonlinear model is difficulty five or 10. <laughs> I believe, allow me to say this. I believe Danny Fred knew that and he knew that if he did that linear, nonlinear thing, very few people were gonna be able to follow him. As a matter of fact, the Army Corps never did. How interesting. The Army Corps hired Fred in the year 1987 to tell him what he was doing and he did. They also hired me to be like a sounding board for Danny Fred. I don't know why. Somebody had the idea that that uh, they had to control Danny. He was from a different agency, right? He was going to tell them what to do. So Danny went in there, and I was there, and he told them that you had to do the nonlinear solution because it was the best, and so on and so forth. That was 1987. And then they kind of dragged their feet for several years, and they never did it. They actually eventually hired the gentleman uh, by name of Bob Barker to do their Hegras Unsteady. And he spent a few years with them. Uh, he was just a guy out of the street. He was a graduate of Colorado State, as a matter of fact, one of our students. One of my, I taught a class in this same class. I taught at Colorado State twice in the year 1979 and 78 and 79. And Bob Barker was there as a student. And then seven, 15 years later, Bob Barker installed or worked for the Army Corps developing the uh, the unsteady component of Hegras, which, by the way, um, I believe uh, Ryan is working on. Ryan is going to talk about it in to us in about a week, how he did with the unsteady. Right, Ryan? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. The, the model that Ryan is going to be working on showing us is a, is a tough thing to run, but Ryan chosen to do that. And that was developed by Bob Barkoff for the Army Corps in the year 1995. 1995, 1998. Okay, so linearization is this one. That's a linearization of Kanj, and it works reasonably well. Then the boundary conditions, and we have uh, an equation from the boundary, which we call nonlinear equation. And I, to be honest with you, I was reading this this morning, or this afternoon, when I was reviewing the class, and uh, I can't explain it to myself, so I'm gonna skip it. But the point is that we tried this equation because it was better than the linear one. So the, for the boundary condition, we were going to go nonlinear. Uh, just let it sit there. But the point is that um, it's been 40 years, right? So uh, the, we created the nonlinear condition because there was an error in one of the papers that had been published on this, so on and so forth. That's the story. The stability and convergence, we already know that subject, so I'm going to go over it. Numerical experiments, we got the formation of sand waves. My, the formation of sand waves, the one that we particularly originally were interested in, how, what is the speed of travel of the sand waves? Migration of the sand waves. I should tell you at this point that it's nice to do numerical, but it, it takes time and effort and knowledge. But if you know the speed from the formula that we had already developed from theory, based on the fruit numbers, it would, it would be easy to get a working number for the, for the speed of the sand waves relatively easy. It would be a couple hours of, of, of work instead of two months or something, or even more, right? So there's something to be said about the theory. Migration of sand waves, erosional and depositional transients. I already talked about this. We wanted to make sure that the model was able to do this properly, and it did. This works fine. 
The speed doesn't matter because you can change the transport function changing the, the, the coefficient of the transport function, not the exponent. But the coefficient of the transport function, the exponent is, is between 3 and 7, but the coefficient could be 1 or 0.1 or 0.01. The coefficient, you can put anything in there if you want to. And they're all empirical anyway. There's, this is not a theoretical value. If you want to do a theoretical value, perhaps you could calibrate this with modifying Einstein, which in my opinion is the best. But then it would require a calibration, data, a lot of study, and so forth. Somebody's got to pay for that. Then we are, another example that we did is the uh, degradation below dam. So the opposite problem. First one is how much sediment can you pile behind a, a sediment dam? And the other problem is what hole, what's the size of the hole that you're going to get downstream from degradation? The first gentleman to identify this problem of degradation below dams was our very good friend, um, um, oh my, his name, he, he 1955, uh, he, he's my, my academic uh, grandfather. He was the professor of Daryl Simons, who was my professor. Okay, this gentleman in 1955 wrote a paper, how did I forget his name? Uh, he wrote a paper in which he talked about this, degradation below dam. He had a famous paper, degradation below Fort Sumner Dam in New Mexico. And he taught us all this stuff at that time, 1955. And I do believe I have talked extensively about this in the class in sedimentation engineering. So the same thing, we were the same thing. And finally, we have the, uh, the, uh, What's going to happen if we make a hole in the ground? The hole is going to travel because it's a transient. It has to be the whole, the whole, the whole width of the channel, though, to, for it to be for it to be be able to be modeled. Otherwise, you won't be able to model it. But many times, uh, people go into into uh, extraction of sand, a business, it's some business, extract sand from the bottom of the river, and use the whole river and do this and we want to know how fast or how how is it going to travel the first question was is it going to travel downstream or upstream and i added i ran into an argument with my professor can you believe it you should not run into an argument with your professor by the way it's not a very good uh, good policy but i actually did uh, in an amicable way because i presented this paper to simons because he actually i believe he actually wrote it no? Well, whatever. So this thing is over here, over here. And we said that based on this model, that the wave, the negative wave, was going to travel downstream. And Simon said, no, it travels upstream. So here is something that I was at a loss as to how to handle. Because I wasn't going to oppose up front to my professor. I, I wasn't going to say, you know what? You don't know what you're talking. No, that's not good policy. On the other hand, I hesitated to doubt my own equations. It, the equation said it was moving downstream. And there is no other equation, so it had to move downstream. So how was I going to convince Simons of this? Well, I studied this. I spent a lot of time uh, looking at this, okay? So what was the answer to this puzzle? And the, the, the answer was very simple at the end. If the problem is one-dimensional, it will move downstream. And that was, I was doing that. If the problem is three-dimensional, it will move upstream. Because three-dimensional laws, we don't know. No, so far, nobody has done a three-dimensional law of sediment transport. No, it doesn't exist. Barely we have Exner, which is one-dimensional. So that was the answer. The issue was that the three-dimensionality uh, would allow it to, it's called the Nix point. It starts the road upstream. The water falls over here. And it start creating a, 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 a cataract, and it moves down upstream. It moves upstream. So he's correct. So we're, we were both correct. Now, granted, in order for you to get a movement downstream, it's hard, but it's not impossible. Because we have had situations where people went and sand mined the heck out of a river, threw out the river, and left it there. And a couple of years later, they had a bridge over here. The bridge failed. Why did the bridge fail? Because of 
the movement of this negative sand and it totally undermined the bridge piers. A bridge is founded on piers. If the piers are undermined and that has happened, we have many experiences with that, it will fail. So uh, there was a case in Mexico, there was a case of other, I don't remember right now other cases, but this is typical. So one should not, one should not uh, do excessive or very large sand waves above bridges that are founded here on piers. Okay, the same thing applies to the to the other side though. If it starts moving upstream, so that's why people come over here. If you have a if you have a bridge over here, engineers come over here and put a wall over here, so as to kind of stop the erosion, the nick erosion, the the one that is moving upstream, the three dimensional erosion, to stop it. So we got to protect our bridges if they're if the bridges so happen to be there from these situations. Now, who and when do they do this? this um, uh, mining of the riverbed. And that is a very interesting question. And if I started talking on that, I could talk for five hours. So I'm not going to. Let me just say that, give you an example. The Pala River here in town, I visited many years ago, maybe 10, 15 years ago, when I was studying this, because I did study this and I wrote papers on this, uh, that uh, they had excavated the Pala River big holes, <coughs> excuse me. And then I asked, I was there with the manager and he told me that the Army Corps of Engineers had got in there and applied the, the, the laws of the country and they told them they had to move out. You gotta suspend this thing, you can't do it. Environmentally unsound and so on and so forth. And we're gonna give you a couple of years to, uh, to move out of here. We don't want you to leave tomorrow, but you gotta get out. Two years, something like that. And then the, the word I asked them, I said a question is, is how uh, did they tell you a limit or anything like that? Because I had con had the experience in Mexico where they were limiting the excavations to four meters in Mexico because the same thing was happening, okay? And uh, the river, the Guadalupe River, which I studied for several years in Mexico, in Ensenada. And I was really surprised when he said, you know what, Professor Pons, they never told us what limit. So we're making a hole in the two years that we have left in this in this site, we're gonna make a hole and we're gonna get to 20 meters, he said. We're gonna get to 20 meters. And sure enough, they did. And below three or four meters, the water starts to show up because it's a river. It's a dry river, but the water is four meters down, right? The water is always moving down. So they were planning to excavate in water up to 20 meters to get all the sand that they could before their permit ran out. How fascinating, economics, right? Beca why? Because sand is, is gold, it's just construction, it's gold. It's a matter of fact, and I'm gonna finish in here in a minute. Uh, after the Army Corps prohibited the mining of sands in the early 90s, uh, this is in the early 90s, then uh, US industry had to go to Mexico and we started mining the, the, the rivers, na the neighboring rivers in in Baja California. We mined a couple, we mined the Las Palmas and we mined the Guadalupe extensively, by the way, and created some problems out there. But in the process of creating the problems, some people made a lot of money because it's like gold. You get it out, you truck it, you put it in barges and you send it back to the US and you sell it. And I believe cubic yard, I don't know at the time, 20, 30, 40 bucks for a cubic yard. That's a lot of money. Just multiply it. So I'm going to stop in here in the theta function, the theta function, I probably won't be able to get to the other model. The theta function, you can see in here, the theta was the same thing. If you hire, if you raise the theta to one, it was going to obliterate the results. And it turned out that in this case, it was good because this peak in here should not be there. It should be like relatively smooth. So we were, as you can see in here, theta one gives you a smooth value. Point A would be better. Point six, no good. So in water, 0.55 to 0.6, but in here, we require a point A for the theta, so it will smooth the perturbations and you can come up with a calculation. The problem that we had in here was a, it was a kind of a tough problem, that this stuff was going to start to steepen and it would eventually break. No model can, can steep into the point where it, would be, where it would become a wall of sand because at that point, the model will give up calculating. The model has to do averages 
and if there's no average in there. So this problem was good while it lasted. If it continues to steepen like that, it will break down. It will not give you an answer. So I hate to tell you, but that was the correct uh, conclusion that we got out of, out of modeling this. At the beginning, we didn't know that, by the way. But the other problems are good. These other problems are good. This uh, problem here does not have to have, does not seem to have a whole lot of practicality because the wave will steepen and it will eventually break. So if you're going to pursue the wave downstream, you won't be able to. Okay, so that's the end of this paper, and I'm going to use the next five minutes and not give it justice, justice to the last one, modeling gradual dam breaches. So I'm going to probably just uh, talk briefly of this. Modeling gradual dam breaches. There's 50,000, this paper was written 40 years ago. It says there's 50,000 dams in the United States, 40% of which have been classified as potentially dangerous to life and property. By now, there should be maybe 60,000. There was not a whole lot of dams that were built in the last 40 years, by the way, because dams became, at the beginning of the env in environmental revolution, the year 1970, 50 years ago, it became the thing that nobody really wanted. Never mind the, uh, if I may say so, many environmentalists did not realize that they had to shower every day or they were showering every day and they were eating and washing and using water that was stored in the, in the, in the reservoir so that they could do that, that we can live there. It is nobody's, nobody's secret that the reason why we are here in Southern California is because we're pumping the water from the north, we're pumping water from the east, the Colorado River, the rivers in the north, Shasta, Oroville, and so forth. We're bringing all that water at great expense and probably unsustainably, the big word. There was a big guy, a guy by the name of Reisner that wrote a book in the year 84, I believe. It was a good book. It's called Cadillac Desert, The Problems of Water of the Western United States. Yes, 120 years ago, California was settled. And in order to settle California, we had to move the water all around. Because if we didn't move it, California was going to blip. It was going to disappear. That's been written, by the way. It's not my invention. Okay? We had to underpin society with a water structure, water infrastructure, moving the water around at great expense. But it was very successful at the time. Because at the time, 100 years ago, when we started doing this, there was no issue of sustainability. There was no issue of forced fossil fuels. Those issues only came up 100 years later in retrospect. So now we realize we made a, we made a messed up, but it's too, I guess you could say, too late to fix it immediately. We will eventually fix it, but it will take 50 to 100 years, four generations for us to fix it. And we will have to fix it. The new generation will learn better ways of doing things, conserving, as opposed to developing our right for the heck of it, as we did. I, I'm sorry I have to say that, but that's the truth, and I believe it. There's a lot of things that were done 100 years ago that we did not know that they were not quite correct. Okay, so so the dams. The dams breach. We knew that the dams breach because there's no better ex experience than Teton Dam, which failed uh, June 5, 1976. And this is a picture. It came out of Time magazine. So people, they were, there's hundreds and thousands, literally thousands of dams in the United States. And people, the normal folks, had never paid attention to it. They just, particularly in the Western United States, we, without the dams, we couldn't be here. Eastern, not so much. But what happened was one failure, which was Teton Dam, 1976. And several of these pictures that you see in here were published in Time Magazine, in the cover of Time Magazine. So everybody got to know that there were dams out there first. They looked at the dams and therefore, and, and that they could fail. Now, why did this dam fail? Okay. The Bureau of Rec built from the year of its creation, which is 1903, 1905, 1910, to 1976, that's 70 years, they built a whole lot of dams. I don't know how many, but the number of 100, at least 100, if not 200 dams that were built by the Bureau of Rec in the Western United States, in the 11 Western United States. And I believe, and I quote, I say this quoting people that have talked about it. They became, what's the word? 
they thought that they were good. They thought that they were really good, that they could not make a mistake. And of course they were wrong. Anybody could make a mistake, you know that. And they made a mistake. Teton was a mistake. They forced their way into the Teton Valley and they, they uh, felt that they could um, uh, apply concrete to the cracks. There were cracks out there all over. And they said, no, no, we're gonna fix these. And they fixed the cracks. But you can you never know when you work underground whether you actually fixed it or not. You can call all the experts, but the experts can make mistakes too. So they made a mistake. And in the first filling, Teton Dam breached. We have a video on that, by the way, which I believe I have shown it. And if I have not shown it, I'm gonna show it tonight to you. I believe I have Teton. We have a video, which is a video of, in, on my side that that has one of the, some of the most traffic. I believe this week it was like 200 views, 200, 300 views per day on this video that we have on Teton. We took all the information, you know, the videos, there's a lot of videos on Teton, by the way, but not very technical. Mine was technical because we're an engineer. We know how to do it, the technical part. Uh, we wanted to talk to the engineers. So we did that video and Teton Dam failed because the core lowered their, uh, no, not the core, the arm, uh, the Bureau of Rec, they lowered the guard. Everybody knows that, even they ac accept it. And uh, it, this thing failed. But the question is, the breaching of a dam, the failure of a dam, is something that people at the time didn't know what to do or how to study it. And we had had failures, we had failures at the Vion Dam in, in Italy, which did not fail and yet killed 2,000 people. How did that happen? <laughs> Let me repeat that. The dam was concrete. It was an arch gravity dam. And those dams do not fail, okay? Because you're gonna have to break the concrete and that stuff. You had to have an earthquake and so on and so forth, but they reinforce it, so whatever. I do not believe I have seen or I know of an arch gravity that has failed, okay? So how come we killed 2,000 people? Well, what happened was that they called in the geologists and the geologists say, well, you know what? We could have a slide in here. And the slide is this size and is going to get into the, into the reservoir and it will create a wave. And if the reservoir is full, the wave will overflow. It was a whole bunch of chunk of dirt or soil you're going to throw into a, a, full, a full glass and obviously it's going to overflow. So they calculated the overflow and they figured it was, it was going to be okay. It's not going to hurt. That's what they said. That was in the 60s, 50s, 60s, 50s, when they were doing these design of the Vion Dam. Google it, V-A-I-O-N-T, Northern Italy. So you can check and see what I'm telling you right now. Okay, what happened was that, sure enough, the, the sites were unstable. And a few months later, after they filled the dam, the thing sli slid into the, into, the, uh, into the reservoir, which was full. Only problem is that the volume of the slide was 10, 10 times the estimated. And it created this huge wave that went on top of the dam and it went downstream and it, they had a town of, of lots of people in that town within a few miles from the dam. They were really sure what they were doing. 2,000 people were killed in the Bayon disaster, 1961. Okay, so that's one story. But in here, what we're doing in here is modeling gradual breaches because when you have a gradual breach, you do not have a, um, an instantaneous failure. Usually, if a dam's gonna fail, people that know this, they model a five minute failure. In five minutes, the whole thing is gonna crack down and it's gonna develop this huge wave, a wave which is so sudden that, that is dynamic wave, and it will move upstream and downstream because dynamic waves have two components of propagation. And of course, we're concerned about mostly about the, da about the downstream because that's the one that's gonna kill people, okay? But the problem was that when you have a gradual breach like that of Teton, which failed in three hours, it's not going to be two waves. It's going to be more like a kinematic wave, a kinematic diffusive wave, which only has one component of propagation, which is downstream. So this thing failed in three hours. So we had an experience of a dam in Peru. Let me, let me close up in here in a couple of minutes. A dam in Peru that had slid out of the, a mountain 
and created a huge 170 meter dam, which prompted, uh, continued to fill up. And they realized based on the rate of filling of the, of the river or the dam that had accidentally been put on top of the river, that it would take two months to, to fill up and overflow. There's nothing it could be doing. It could be done. It was going to overflow. So they waited for a couple of months and sure enough, the dam did overflow. But the question before it overflowed was, what's going to be the rate of failure? And all kinds of hydraulic engineers were doing all kinds of calculations. Okay. There was a calculation. Let me allow me to say this. There, there was a calculation that it was going to be kind of sudden. It was going to, it's a huge volume, by the way, of water. Then it was going to generate a flood of a, a, a million cubic meters per second which basically would erase everything. Let's say, or let's consider that the Amazon River at Obidos rates at 220,000. So this was gonna be five times the volume of the Amazon River, impossible, impossible. So we decided, and we knew that this was gonna be gradual. Not only that, but we also knew that that dam had not been engineered and the slopes, the slopes of the slope where angle of repose so the slopes of upstream and downstream were not the normal two to one or three to one like in like here did you see that's two to one usually that's the way they design dams uh or three to one they go all the way get all the way up to three to one it was like more ten to one so i figured this is not going to fail not going to fail even in three hours so sure enough we created the model we compared it with the data and so on and so forth and we came out correctly. Here's the correct. The peak discharge was estimated at 13,000 cubic meters, not a million, but 13,000 cubic meters. And we were able to model, to juggle the numbers and calculate, calibrate, simulate 13,200 and the rest, the hydrogas were reasonable. Everything was reasonable. So we proved that this can be done with a model of a sediment, a sediment model, a model that we were working at the time. So with that, I finish in here, and you can review this paper for what it's worth. I may ask a few questions, particularly of the stuff that I have spoken out here. You know, the stuff that I already made clear to you that that's what I wanted to say. We uh, uh, ran out of time, but that's going to be it. So when I come back on Wednesday, I'm going to be handling the two-dimensional model, which we put together in the year 1980. Um, that's it. So with that, then I'm going to, to stop the class in here. And uh, I will see you uh, this um, Wednesday. And that will be the last class.